thank you for coming out. It's really beautiful out today. Um, and I'm really excited about this. We have the chance to hear from Professor Schiller. Um, I met Professor Schiller when I was a freshman. I took her intro class, uh, Intro to American Politics. It was online. We only had the chance to come in person once every couple weeks, um, brought in 20 at a time. But uh, I would go to office hours, we would discuss politics, and I got to know her pretty well through that. And um, I began to do research with her, and now, um, I, I mean, I'm very uh, lucky to have her as a mentor. So. I, the way that this is going to work is we're going to hear from Professor Schiller for about, about 15 minutes, I believe, um, on the research projects that she's been participating in. Um, and I have been part of some of those. Um, and then afterwards, we'll move to a moderated Q&A. We'll, we'll all start with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So again, thank you all for being here, and thank you to Professor Schiller. Nice job. Good afternoon. Welcome to Brown. Um, uh, it's yeah, beautiful weekend ahead of you, so that's terrific. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So uh, I wanted to sort of say why why I'm here talking about this work today and um, this collaboration is that um, this is uh, the middle uh, of my 30th year at Brown University. Uh, it has changed enormously for some of you who've, who graduated in the 90s. It's grown. Uh, it's got new architecture, new buildings, uh, and some faculty who are still here. Uh, and I'm a professor, I'm the Allison S. Ressler Professor of Political Science and the director of the Taubman Center for American Politics and Policy. And I wanted to really sort of, you probably say, well, what do your professors do? You know, when they're not in the classroom and they're not in office hours, what do they do? And what is special about Brown uh, in terms of the relationship between students and faculty? How do you build research relationships? What happens to the students who work with faculty? And I've been really fortunate, particularly in the last you know, eight years or so, but even before that, uh, to be able to work with both Brown graduate students and Brown undergraduate students uh, in research projects. There's a couple of ways that we do this. So one is a straightforward way where um, an RA, a research student, says, I'm interested in research. Usually it's generated by being in a class with a professor. And do you need a research assistant? What Brown has done in the last 15 years is make research funds much more readily available to faculty to pay undergraduate students. Prior to that, you'd apply for an UTRA. I don't know if you remember what an UTRA is, an Undergraduate Teaching Research Award, which is a terrific opportunity. But those are very competitive. And so sometimes there were limited opportunities to pay students to do research. Instead, you would do an independent study with students. They would get course credit, and they would learn research skills. So that's changed a lot. Now there are many, much, there's much more university money. There's more uh, professors have research accounts. And that has really um, spread the opportunities for research for students in a really terrific way. So I've been fortunate to benefit from that and worked with uh, several teams of research students. And we do also recruit. So Donnie um, was really stood out in our, in our summer class and coming to virtual office hours. And, and so about a year later, when we were talking in person in office hours, he said he was interested in doing research. And he's an IAPA major, not a political science major. Not that I'm saying anything bad about IAPA. It's fantastic. Um, so it doesn't matter. You can be a major in a different place and still um, and still uh, work with professors in any field. It, it, we, don't, we don't mind at all. And, uh, and Donnie had particular interests mostly in the law and the judicial system. And I'll tell you a little bit about the project that he's been working on. But if you see below, uh, Kaylin and Sidorsky, now she's moved to Ramapo in New Jersey, but she was, she was my PhD student, one of my PhD students. I was the chair of her dissertation committee. She did her own work, and then as she was graduating, she said, um, we should collaborate on a project on gender and women's equality, gender equality, women's security. And I had just been promoted to full professor, having finished my second book, and then become chair of the department. And I thought, I can finally work on gender, because I hadn't done that before in my career. So she, she was the engine. She really was the conductor of the train. Uh, and so we have published a book and several articles, and we could not have done it without uh, Brown undergrads. Um, who are terrific, all of whom were paid 
every cent for everything that they did. And what they really like is that they have credits on publications. So when we publish an article, we have acknowledgments that say thanks to these students. And they got really good jobs, which I'm really proud of after graduation. So um, these are some of the students that worked on the project. Isabel Culver, who's at the Federal Reserve. Emerson Goodrich, who does international relations. I don't know where she is now. She hasn't kept up with me so much. Lauren Muse is going to graduate this year. Amanda Page. Daniel, who you're meeting. Isabel Yeps, who's also doing international relations. Chloe Zikla is at Brookings. Um, and we have a whole new team this year that's working with us. Um, and there's a, a few others who are now in law school, who worked after they worked on the project in fields related to the subject matter and then have gone on to law school. So that's, that's what can happen. And it happens because students take the initiative This is the, uh, uh, to ask a professor if there's a research opportunity. Brown has changed the system. So now faculty, and I think it's a, a, a great way of extending these opportunities for your information, Brown has changed the system. We are now required, and I think it's a good thing, to advertise any research position that we have through something called Workday. Students can check Workday and look at all the available positions and apply. So it's opened up uh, research opportunities, I think, across the university. And then we do interviews with the students, and we form our teams that way. So there's just a vast opportunity for collaborative research. And I highly encourage you to gently encourage your um, offspring to pursue them. So why, why this? Inequality across state lines, uh, how policymakers have failed domestic violence victims. The argument in this book, which just came out in March, the argument in this book is that women cannot be equal to, even to other women across state lines if they are not safe in their human security, in their human person, their physical security. That before you think about pay equity, before you think about um, workplace um, uh, equity, before you think even about reproductive rights and all the things that go into child care, um, uh, everything that affects women in their daily lives, the first place we argue is security in the home, being free from physical, um, sexual, and psychological violence. The federal government has laws, and the states have laws. And domestic violence, I think even the term, the description, frequently suggests that it's a private matter. And until the 1980s, it was considered a private matter. It was not in the public sphere nor the legal sphere. So every 20 minutes, someone is abused by an intimate partner. One in four women and one in nine men will experience severe intimate partner abuse. And nearly 50% of women who are killed by an intimate partner are killed by a gun. So in the course of our research, we really honed in on the most lethal types of domestic violence and the intersection with gun, uh, what we call gun safety laws, gun control, normally called gun control, and how these intersect, the, the laws and the politics. So this is just a, a timeline really quickly. Um, as Donnie knows, I can go off, but I'm going to stay focused. Um, so this is, if you can see sort of uh, the civil rights. This is like the history of federal intervention. The first Family Violence Prevention Act is really is, is um, introduced in 1977, 1978. Doesn't really, really hit home till 1984, 1984. And the first Violence Against Women Act was sponsored by then Senator Joseph Biden in 1990, re-sponsored in 1992, and passed in 1994. It wasn't until 1994 that any federal legislation was passed. In 1996, the Lautenberg Amendment is passed. These are two very important laws. Why are they so important? The Violence Against Women takes domestic violence at the federal level and puts it into the public sphere, specifically in the Justice Department, in the legal uh, sphere of prosecuting crimes, saying it is act in a public crime. And in it, it becomes a crime to sell or give a firearm to anyone under a domestic violence restraining order. I'll come back to that point, but that is a crucial, crucial part of VAWA. In addition, if you are convicted of a felony, you cannot own a gun. That's the Violence Against Women Act. 1996, Lautenberg Amendment, Senator Frank Lautenberg, anybody from New Jersey? 
Um, Donnie's from New Jersey. So Senator Frank Lautenberg has a, a lot of legislative accomplishments, but the Lautenberg Amendment amended the Gun Control Act to say that if you're convicted of a misdemeanor, and that includes misdemeanor domestic violence charge, you cannot have a gun. These two are the, are the pillars of federal law on domestic violence. And for those of you who think to yourself, oh, if only the federal government could pass a law, things would get better. It is, there's no question that with the passage of federal law in the area of domestic violence, it, things have gotten better. The rates of violence, the number of violent incidents have gone down since the 1990s. But in order for these federal laws to be effective, states have to pass complementary laws. It's not enough for the federal government. The reason is that when states pass the laws, they will implement these laws. They will invest in these laws. And so what we discovered in our research was that there is a tremendous amount of variation across state lines in, in which states pass which laws, particularly related to the intersection of domestic violence or restraining orders and ownership of guns. It varies from state to state. So women are not equally safe in every state from an abuser with a gun, even when there's federal law in the books, because state laws have to be passed too. Federalism is complicated, and federalism creates inequality in security. How do we do this? We had excellent Brown undergraduates helping us, and we started out uh, with a, a, a woman named Gianna Jasinski, who's finishing her third year of Columbia Law School now. And she started just by looking at sexual assault rates. And then she started to look at the punishments for domestic violence, which also vary across state lines. The rehabilitation, the jail time, and financial punishments. So we started there. Then we recruited a woman named Kayla Kaplan, who's starting her first year now at Columbia Law after working um, in the Biden administration. And she started the process of identifying these state laws by hand. Um, well, not by hand, but literally, um, she had to search every state database because the data was not all available in one data, uh, one place. So we started a project, and that's when we started to hire lots of people on the project to help Kayla with that. Fortunately for us as researchers, um, the uh, um, Bloomberg Gun Navigator, the Bloomberg Center on, for Guns and um, Every Town, uh, those was formed after Sandy um, uh, uh, Newtown, Sandy Hook. Um, uh, they fund a, da a whole team now that collects the same data. Unfortunately for us, that data did not become widespread wide available till 2021. And this was 2017 when we started the project. So we, we collected all laws passed at the state level from 1990 to 2016. And all violent um, crime, murder crimes, all state laws, uh, political and demographic variables about all the states. So what do we find? We think about uh, domestic violence firearm laws. Uh, public health and criminologists do a terrific job on really the empirical impacts of these laws. And two scholars, um, Diaz and all, Carolina Diaz and her crew and um, April Zioli, they find that these laws that we're talking about, with, which restrict your ability to own or possess a gun if you're under a temporary restraining order, if you've been convicted of stalking, um, if you are a dating partner who's committed abuse, the states have been ahead of the federal government on that. That all reduces death from domestic violence. And we also found that gun control ordinances in general from other people are more likely to be adopted in democratic areas, denser areas. Um, and then um, Sierra Smucker and her work, she does terrific job, qualitative research, looking at the ways that interest groups dedicated to this try to pass laws in which states. So you would say to yourself, um, the federal government must give you incentives to pass these laws. If you have federal law on the books, don't you want states to pass the laws that will help implement the federal law? The answer is no. The federal government does give any, no incentives. They stay out of it, really, except that when they pass major legislation, we find in our work that states respond by also passing complementary laws. Uh, and we also find that if you're, if you're adjacent to a state, you may say to yourself, oh, there's horizontal policy diffusion. If Connecticut's doing it, New York will do it, or Rhode Island will do it, or Massachusetts will do it. That turns out not to be true. We thought it would be true, but it's not true. 
So these are the laws that we're talking about. I'll sort of cruise through these. But these are crucial laws, and you can see number of states with each particular law. Nowhere do we see 50 on any of these categories. Nowhere. So it's, it's super varied, and it creates um, real inequality uh, for women in their security. Thankfully, I would say dating partners, that has actually increased quite a bit since this table was first um, put together. So what are our findings? The number of gun homicides increases the likelihood of adopting these laws, but the number of mass shootings does not. How much frustration do I think a lot of us feel when there's a mass shooting? And we define mass shootings by four or more um, casualties in those mass shootings. And how frustrating when you say nothing happens, nothing happens. It's the steady flow of gun homicides much more than mass shootings that, affects, that affect legislators, with a couple of exceptions. There's vertical policy diffusion, which just means that um, when the federal government does something, that initial burst of action does actually encourage states to do more. Part of what the students did in the research was figuring out what vertical policy diffusion is. So for example, some of the things that students will do is collect journal articles that are on the topic, or it could be, and Donnie has done this for the, po uh, the project I'm about to describe. And so they'll learn how to figure out which journals matter, how to read a journal article, how to summarize a journal article, how to learn how to cite, how to properly attribute research. That's what we call qualitative work. The data collection is to put things in usually Excel. They like Google Sheets. I like Excel. <clears throat> we have a negotiation. Usually I win. <laughs> but that means they know how to use Excel. And Excel is this incredibly powerful tool. You can do a lot of statistics with it. And they also learn um, statistical packages, thing, uh, packages that actually allow you to uh, analyze data. They don't always love it but they learn it. So when they're done being an RA on this particular project, they have a set of skills they didn't have before, and they were paid to accrue those skills. That's the goal, I think, of each of us at Brown, our faculty. No matter what kind of work we do, we really want the students to come out better prepared and more skilled than when they came to us in the first place. Um, a unified Republican state legislature decreases the likelihood of domestic violence firearm law adoption and a more liberal state citizenry increases the likelihood. Why am I not using the mirror image of this? Because we study 1990 to 2016. So we have seen over the last 30 years a stronger intersection between the National Rifle Association and the Republican Party. That the Republican Party as a party has adopted more of the planks of the NRA over time. So legislators who are Republican now in the last 10 or 15 years are less likely to support any gun restrictions at all in any context. But Democrats in the South from 1990 to about 2005 also opposed gun restrictions. They tended to be far more conservative than the Democratic Party is today. So statistically, when you put all those time periods together, the Democratic Party washes out because it flips from being conservative um, to liberal. And the Republican Party, was, even in the 80s, was not super excited about gun control legislation. But even Bob Dole, who was the minority leader of the, Republican Senate, of the Republican Party in the Senate, and then the majority leader, worked on the assault weapon ban and passed that with Bill Clinton in 1994. Dianne Feinstein, the late Dianne Feinstein, was a sponsor of that bill. So things have changed politically. However, if you use ideology, a liberal state, the more liberal you are over time, the more likely you are to pass the law. So when students are working on this, they also learn about the difference between party and ideology, which are important conceptual differences. And in election year, nobody passes a law uh, to restrict guns at all. Democrats, Republicans, nobody in an election year. We have control for lots of demographic variables. And the percentage of women doesn't matter statistically. Having a female governor doesn't matter, although there are not very many female governors during this period of time. State culture and the number of women murdered by a family member with a gun specifically do not encourage state legislators to pass these laws. The overall gun homicide rate is the most important, as I said before. Now, judicial implementation. Here's where Donnie's been uh, uh, key and maybe can help in the Q&A talk about what you did. 
We have a paper we're working on now. So we published two papers from this project with the help of RAs, and then the book, and then a third paper this past summer that isn't in the book on Native American uh, domestic violence courts and uh, implementation of domestic violence laws in Native American communities and tribal governments. Um, Native American and indigenous women are the most likely to be subject to domestic violence abuse from non-Native men. Um, and that's a, I can talk about that in Q&A. State level trial court judges control the implementation of domestic violence law, period. If you need a temporary or a permanent restraining order, custody battles, whatever, and they also can issue warrants to make somebody surrender their gun or have the police go and get the gun. The problem, the very severe problem with the, that last solution is that 25% of all injuries to law enforcement on, an, on a yearly basis come from serving domestic violence calls. Domestic violence spreads everywhere. It has an impact on every, everybody. 68% of mass shooters had some connection to domestic violence in this country. That's from Lisa Geller at Johns Hopkins. So state trial court judges are crucial to making these laws work. And that's what Donnie's been working on. How do you do that? You buy a subscription to the American bench and raise an attorney. The American bench lists every single state court judge in the country, but they don't do it electronically. I mean, they do, but they don't. They have it electronically, but they don't, uh, they don't compile it. So you have to go through it and create a, a very, 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 very big Excel data sheet, right? So Max Harris did it. You did it. Abigail Carbajal. She's also at Columbia now. <clears throat> she just graduated. Um, and so uh, I had teams of people uh, working on this. And it, it, you'll describe it in the Q&A. So um, inconsistent uh, laws applied inconsistently. Judges' characteristics, age, gender, ideology, race, play a role in decision making. And we wanted to see if they played a role in decision making about domestic violence. So female judges, we know, and judges with daughters are more likely to make decisions favorable to women in general in, in courts. And ideology and partisanship are the characteristic of the most influence on decision making. That's the general judicial literature in political science and public policy. Um, the method of selecting and retaining judges. This is something students learn, many of whom are now in law school or going to law school. But they learn that, in fact, the way we select judges in this country differs state to state. You can have judges that are appointed, and then they have to run for re-election, or they have to be reappointed. And we have judges that never run for re-election. Um, we've seen how important that can be in the Wisconsin State Supreme Court, for example, which is having some controversy over that. So. Student involvement. Students collected data on thousands of judges across the country, um, and they cleaned it up, meaning they corrected spelling, and they, they put all sorts of demographic data in a database. And that's what it looked like. This is courtesy of Donnie, and Donnie did this slide. So this is exactly what the data would look like. Uh, and again, they were paid, I think, pretty well for this. Um, and, and I think for anybody going to law school, figuring out the composition of judges in this country was a really uh, educational thing. At least that's what we told ourselves about asking them to do it. Uh, and then we see um, Donnie on the other side. This is the percent of people, when you say 300 or more, you want to explain what the number of cases are here? Yeah, so this was, um, we were looking at how many cases a judge heard per year um, and how often they heard domestic violence cases. Um, but I think one of the interesting things is you can see the data is very different in between the first and the first and second um, spreadsheet, and that was a lot of work uh, went into that it to basically re transform all the data into um, when you when you're looking at I don't know what it's what race somebody is you can't do a statistical analysis on the word Caucasian the word you have to convert it into other variables and so that was very useful for me to get the chance to learn how to prepare data and, and to change, transform it to make it usable. Yeah, and that's what the students learn as well. You know, how do we do this? How do we take data that we call descriptive um, or normative data, not normative, but descriptive, nominal data, and descriptive, and then be able to, to tell people patterns about it? So we had done a survey of public defenders and district attorneys about their general caseloads in an effort to figure out what percentage were domestic violence driven and then what were the outcomes of the case in terms of punishment. We found that between 40 and 42% of all cases heard in courts are domestic violence related. 
this takes up a tremendous amount of, of our digital system. And so here we see slightly a lot of variation um, in the number and the judges and when they say how many cases we had and what percentage were domestic violence. Really, bless you. So um, right now, the paper is entitled Decisions Matter, Digital Impl Implementation of Domestic Violence Laws at the State Level. And we, uh, my colleague, Caitlin, had written a draft paper that we delivered at a conference in April. And then when we were talking to Donnie after he came back from his very prestigious, which he failed to mention, internship with the Department of Justice last summer in the Office of Disability Rights. He had a terrific internship. Um, we reached out to him and said, you're a senior. You've done a lot of great work. We're interested in putting this paper forward to get published. We think it's appropriate if you would like to be a co-author, a full co-author. If you would like to work with us on this, you can get a co-author credit, meaning his name will be with ours um, should it get published. And we've identified a journal that we want to submit it to. So now Donnie's sort of elevated uh, to our co-author position and working on advancing the paper. So, so far, it, we did a survey. I think we identified we sent it out to 3,300 like 3, judges randomly selected. We use a program called Qualtrics. And we got a return rate of just under like 280, I think, responses. Then you think, well, that's not very good. It's actually very good for surveys. Usually the response rate is, is between 5 and 7%. So we feel really comfortable with our response rate. So based on that data, what judges said in response to a survey, we don't have the survey on the slide, but questions about how, what's your caseload, um, as we just showed you, what decisions do you make, how many times did you order the surrender of a gun? How many times did you issue restraining orders? So the ideology of judges, we asked them, are you liberal conservative? Kind of a rough cut. Um, and, and, and the ideology of the state do not influence judges' implementation of domestic violence laws. African American judges are more likely to order the removal of firearms during a bail hearing, but less likely to remove a firearm during a domestic violence case. So that's an interesting thing. The time of most acute danger for domestic violence victims is after they've pressed charges and there's a bail hearing and then their abuser gets out on bail before the case goes to trial. So the, this is the most acutely dangerous time. It's interesting that there appears to be a difference between African American judges self-identified and uh, white or Latino judges. Judges in the South are more likely to remove a DV defendant's firearm as part of their bail conditions. Judges in the South. Um, the types of domestic violence laws enacted by state matters for judicial implementation. So the existence of a law that removes firearm access for ex parte, that's temporary restraining orders, increases the likelihood that a judge will remove a firearm during a domestic violence case. Meaning, states can either order judges to order the removal or the surrender of a weapon or, or issue a restraining order that prohibits gun ownership. States can order judges to do that, mandate them. Or more frequently, state law gives judges the discretion to do that. Our argument, um, uh, based on what we see, and most of the time, these pretty horrific anecdotal cases, but most of the time, uh, when judges fail to enforce um, the prohibition on guns, violence ensues against the victim. But the law enforcement community will tell you, and it's a very valid point, that it's very difficult to do this. It's difficult to go get guns from people. Um, it's dangerous, but it's also hard. Sometimes a person will give it to a friend or a family member. Very hard. And sheriffs will tell you they don't have the capacity to hold the gun because the prohibition only lasts as long as the restraining order. And an ex parte sometimes is two weeks, just two weeks. A longer term can be issued by a judge, but in some states, like the state of Michigan, you can't get a long-term restraining order for domestic violence unless you file for divorce. So every state is different. You can see how a lot of these federal laws get very watered down when the states implement them. How a judge is selected, uh, whether appointed or elected, doesn't uh, exert any statistical significant effects. So that's where we are now. I'm going to ask Donnie to tell us a little bit about what he's doing for next steps in his research on this project. Yeah, so right now I'm doing a literature review of uh, one of the journals that we've looked at uh, and selected for publication. Um, I'm currently looking through, sifting through the past 
five years for now of uh, articles in the journal, seeing if they have information about how judges make decisions and whether there's other uh, just literature on the topic, research on the topic, and hopefully that'll inform the approach we take. And that's part of the co-authorship respons co -authorship responsibility. So for the data analysis, Caitlin <clears throat> and I will do that. And we will bring Donnie into those conversations, which we've done with all of our RAs. Um, Donnie, uh, and Donnie uh, has worked on the literature review. He'll continue to write the literature review. And then we'll put it all together. We'll write it together. We'll edit it together. Um, and we will continue to work on it. And then we'll submit it. And um, if we get published, then Donnie will be a full co-author. So that's part of what can come out of. And he'll be paid for what um, We've decided we've, we've worked that out. So uh, there are some parts of which uh, he'll get paid for and some parts he won't because if you're a co-author, traditionally you don't get paid for the work. But, but we've worked out an agreement where you'll get paid for um, all this literature review work and everything else. So it's a, a, a great way. And I do think that Brown does this better and in a more widespread fashion than most other peer institutions. OK. So I'm going to leave this because I could talk. You don't have time for me. I could talk for a long time on this. This is our next project. And we have a couple of, I don't know if Emma's here or Jessica's here. Um, but uh, I have a couple of uh, students who are now working with me on a, on, and Caitlin and I on a next project. And so we just continue to be able to work with terrific Brown students. So I'm happy to share that with you and talk about that. And then uh, Donnie's got a couple questions for me, but we can open it up to you all to see if you have any questions about this process or about um, anything else about Brown or student experience. See, I told, I told you. Donnie said, well, they're going to have a lot of questions. And I said, maybe not in the beginning. Oh, we have a question. I'm sorry, what? The new Office of Gun Violence will not address gun violence, do you know? Yeah, you mean in the Justice Department at the federal level? So the, 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 what we're studying now is the Office on Violence Against Women. Oh, yeah. The question was the new Office on Gun Violence that uh, the Justice Department is creating and that Biden's working on um, as an epidemic across the country. So uh, do I think that that office will help with uh, domestic violence gun-related uh, um, uh, injury and death. So the Office on Violence Against Women uh, spends $500 million a year in grants to states and nonprofit organizations uh, for gun violence prevention, for domestic violence prevention and, and gun violence prevention. Um, I do think that the vast majority of crimes committed by domestic violence abusers with guns are committed with legal guns. So if the focus of the Office on Gun Violence is on ghost guns or um, illegal guns, stolen guns, I don't think it's going to make a big dent in domestic violence gun-related deaths. But if it's focused on well, you know, background checks and making sure that people who have felony convictions or misdemeanor convictions are not able to get a gun, I think it will be helpful. But the Office on Violence Against Women funds law enforcement across the country Every law enforcement uh, agent, national, either the state attorney general's office or police departments in big cities apply for grants. And the, the issue is really preventing the lethality of the violence. And that's where the guns come in. And now you can argue somebody, sadly, in Europe, for example, women can be, be beaten or strangled, horrible things. I don't want to uh, upset people, uh, but not shot. Uh, and you can argue you know, these things can happen, but the prevalence of guns, the easy access to guns, I think in the height of an argument, increases lethality. So studies in public health show, literally, that, a, that if you are in a household with a gun with domestic violence, women in particular um, are you know, so much more likely to be killed. You know, any, anything from five times as likely to 500% more likely to be killed. So that's the intersection with guns, and making it, and we, and we fall through the cracks all the time in terms of somebody being arrested, and they're arrested for assault, but not domestic violence, but they're not convicted, so they don't necessarily uh, have the prohibition against having a gun. There's also the problem that when a domestic violence restraining order that's ex parte is issued, it's issued without a bail hearing, 
and it's issued by a judge in an emergency situation, sometimes the person who's the subject of that restraining order does not know there's a prohibition against having a gun. Literally is not informed about that. So I, I'm hopeful, but I'm not sure it's going to fix this particular part of gun violence problem. Yes? Also, everyone, if you want to walk up to the mics, you're welcome oh, to. Yeah, there are mics. Okay. I can repeat the question. Susie is going to project. I uh, so deeply appreciate this. Thank you for what you're, what you're doing to help keep people more safe. Um, are you looking at not just the judicial assertion of the laws, but also the law enforcement assertion of the laws, which I understand can be variable not just across states, but even within states and counties. So um, that's Susie Levine, and she uh, is also a senior a fellow at Watson and also taught a class last year that I literally just crashed her class uh, because she had the research director and the president of every town uh, in the seminar, and I just walked in and sat down, and you were gracious to let me do that. So you've also brought this issue to our attention at Brown and with students. Um, yeah, so we are not looking at law enforcement wholesale. We have colleagues who are, who are working on a book about sheriffs and their enforcement of laws across the board. Um, Mira Holman and Emily Farris, and they're working on a book that's coming out next year. We're not doing that. However, we do have in the book, and we, have, um, uh, we are working on something called lethality assessment programs, which are implemented by law enforcement departments around the country. There are a series of 10 or 11 questions. The Maryland um, Network to End Domestic Violence created this about uh, almost 20 years ago. And it's a simple questionnaire. And the police, when they get a domestic violence call and they go, individual police departments decide whether to use the lethality LAP. And when they do, if the victim um, answers the questions in such a way that it's indicated that there'll be lethal violence, and the, the most pr biggest predictor is whether your partner has tried to choke you or strangle you, that's the biggest predictor, then they will call social services at that moment and say to the abused person, do you want us to get you out of the house now? We recommend you get out, we're gonna call social services. It's key that they make that, that support service call. This is why mental health professionals and people who are worried, I think rightly so, about police violence, particularly against African Americans and other groups, saying we should have social workers or mental health workers who go with the police, who can help diffuse situations. That's not my bailiwick, but the spirit of the LAP is that, is that you bring in social worker that says, I'll take you to a shelter, uh, we'll protect you, we'll get you situated. Because otherwise, before that, women were left on their own to call the hotline and find a way to get to a shelter. Now, in departments that use LAPs, there is an actual system. The problem with it is that not all police departments, even in the same uh, county or you know, state, use it in the same way. Um, how many are there? 13 or 15,000 police departments in the country? I think 13,000 police departments. Um, so, you know, there's just not, not all of them use it. And the second uh, problem is sometimes the victim herself or himself will not really want to acknowledge the possibility of lethal violence. The very tragic case in Utah where a man killed his whole family with a gun. The wife, they did an LAP on a domestic violence call. The man had abused the daughter and the, the mother called the police. They went to the home. They had her fill out the LAP. Utah has some really amazing domestic violence practices. And um, they said, it, it, it looks to us like you're in lethal danger from your answers to the question, do you want us to help you? She said, no, 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 he would never do anything that drastic. I can handle myself. It's very, very sad. So these are, these are on the ground, but it's getting better and more departments are using LIPs. So that's the only connective tissue to law enforcement. I'm gonna ask you and then you. Yes, sir. to actually take guns away, but to at least prevent them from purchasing guns. Because in our case, the shooter's family manipulated the system, so none of the events that had happened to him over years triggered any kind of background check that was So what you're looking at, are, are, is that different than, because what, what, what you described are, are situations where the victim has to ask for a 
or streaming one. Mm -hmm. Right. And the law enforcement might have been called there four or five times, never get a restraining order, but I believe the red flag laws allow the law enforcement to actually enact something. Right. right. So this is a question about red flag laws that are called emergency risk protection orders. And they, they are, um, and April Zioli at the University of Michigan uh, is one of the country's leading experts on red flag laws now. Uh, she's got a good new paper on this. I believe it's either 20 or 22, but I think it's 20 states now have red flag laws, including the state of Rhode Island. And red flag laws mean that you are not allowed to have a gun. So if, if you are committed, um, uh, a police, usually it's a police officer, objectively, or will go to the court and say, we think or we have reason to believe this person will do harm to themselves or others, and the court issues a red flag, which means they can go confiscate any guns in the possession of this individual, and frequently that individual is committed to uh, psychiatric care of some kind. But this, these two parts don't always go together, but the police do have the authority under red flag to confiscate weapons under that circumstances. And you can see the dividing line, although Michigan is a, uh, has a Second Amendment provision written into its constitution. It's a, a pro-gun state, but they just passed it. So it's two weeks, that's all it is. But again, the most dangerous time for victims of domestic violence in terms of lethality is the time you decide to leave um, and the time that you re relocate or resituate, and this can frequently be as short as two weeks. So red flag will help with domestic violence gun deaths. Um, I think there's no question. And it's actually an easier process, as you're suggesting, because an outside party can actually request it. But the two, at least two-thirds of all red flag requests are generated by law enforcement. or, you know, a child suicide mm, yeah. is so politicized that, you know, a certain side, the politicians literally won't even talk about requiring a lock on a gun. Yeah, lock guns, fingerprint, uh, trigger locks. Uh, there's lots of things going on. The fastest growing population of buying guns population are women in the last four or five years. Women are the fastest po growing population of gun owners. And there's an argument now being made that women can defend themselves better with a gun in these circumstances. Um, data and public health data shows that has not proven to be true over time, that the presence of a gun in a household usually leads to death of people in the household. So, um, and I have one more thing to say about statistics, but I'll get to the question. Okay. Uh, you had a slide uh, in a table where you had different uh, laws and the number of states mm -hmm. um, that that have um, have those laws on the books, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a correlation between states that have the highest implementation of DVFLs and uh, reduction in domestic violence? Like, for example, uh, is there a, a direct correlation between states that have all these laws implemented on their books that results in lower incidence of domestic violence and gun deaths and partner shooting? Uh, killing um, uh, their spouses or spouses. Yeah, yes. So, so in particular, um, the laws that, per, that the specific the law that um, prevents somebody under a domestic violence restraining order, a longer term one, that reduces um, death by gun in domestic violence by about six percent. And then the law that actually prevents dating partners who have been um, convicted of abuse from having a gun, reduces death by gun by intimate partner by 10%. So there are specific laws in this list that do um, reduce domestic violence death. The correlations are interesting because some states, like Texas, has all eight of these, right? Texas has all of them. Um, not Oklahoma, but Texas has them. Uh, a bunch of states that are considered sort of very gun friendly actually have, Louisiana has a fair number of these, um, have them on the books. So that gets confusing statistically because the highest rate of gun homicides is the southeast in this country, um, gun deaths overall. But in domestic violence restrictions, uh, some of those states have laws. Others don't. Georgia has none. No domestic violence related firearm laws at all. Missouri has one. Montana has none, Wyoming has none, 
So it, it does vary across the board. I mean, my follow-up is if you have, let's say, those two laws that have the highest impact, yeah. won't the right approach be to focus on getting those two laws uh, implemented all across the states? Because those are the ones you're saying are causing the highest impact, right? So, I mean, that would be, uh, you know, that would be a good strategy to make sure you put all yes. the... Yes, it would be. All your energy behind it. it would. The la, although enforcing Lautenberg, the misdemeanor, might have the biggest impact because that means it goes on your record for um, uh, background checks, and so when you don't have that at the state level, you don't have nearly as much opportunity in the background check to, to weed that out. I'm going to take this woman, uh, Mom's Man Action. Thank you for coming, and then I'll take your question. Hi, uh, this is more of a statement than a question. But the gun violence prevention groups in Rhode Island will start their campaign for a safe gun storage law when the next legislative state, um, session starts in January in this state. And we can probably achieve it, but we will need everyone's support. Thank and you. And Moms Demand Action in Rhode Island, by the way, were the key group that enabled the red flag law to be enacted in 2018. Um, that was them. And. Um, They've also been, they also came very close to getting an assault weapon ban in Rhode Island, but just fell a little bit short, although just, I, I think that there may be hope next semester, next year, although it's an election year. Um, so, uh, but they are incredibly forceful. And before I get to your question, I want to say interest groups, in particular, uh, Moms Demand Action, the Rhode Island Coalition Against Gun Violence, the Rhode Island Coalition Against Domestic Violence, these groups across the country are instrumental in Pennsylvania, for example, Wisconsin, key domestic violence laws and guns have been passed because those groups, those leaders, put enough pressure on the legislature to get it done. So if you're thinking about efficacy and you want to be supportive in this arena, look to your local organizations and your state groups because our studies have shown that, our case studies have literally shown uh, that they make a big difference. I'm gonna get to the one question and then Don, go. Yes, sir. Uh, the, your last slide referred to uh about VAWA funding and talked about that flowing to non-governmental organizations. I'm yeah. on the board of a social service agency that has a pretty big domestic violence program, and I, I know they look at lethality. I'm wondering, if, has anyone ever looked at density of nonprofits focusing on domestic violence prevention and awareness, et cetera, and its efficacy in moving the dial? Um, yes, that would be us now, but <laughs> um, not yet. So. Um, I'm just going to cruise through because it's, been, it's Friday afternoon. My father always said never be doing this on a Friday afternoon. Um, but he wasn't an academic. He was a lawyer. Um, so this is what we're doing. This is exactly what we're doing. So we've collected all, and um, it's huge. And I'm, I'm getting old. I, mean, I hope I don't have time to finish it. Um, but Caitlin's much younger. Uh, so, um, but, um, uh, so we are looking at all the grants. And we have downloaded all the data from 2006 to 2021 of every organization that's received money. And the number of non-governmental is a very big number. And what we're trying to figure out, what we already know, is that having the laws on the books on domestic violence doesn't actually affect federal funding decisions. We don't find a correlation between states' actions on these laws and the amount of money or the number of grants. But we're looking at why there's variation across states in the percentage of non-governmental, the number of non-governmental who get it, and which gov non-governmental, and which governmental agencies. And it's not the same across states. So we're going to have answers to that question in a year, because we're academic, and it takes a while. But it's an outstanding question. Thank you. I wanted to end, because we're done. Um, with Donnie has a question, so I thought I'd let Donnie. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know, there is a Supreme Court case this term called United States versus Rahimi. Oral arguments are on November seventh, um, and it is about whether the laws that restraining orders that take away guns from people, um, or, or law, laws that allow the state it's, to take away guns from people with restraining orders, is even a constitutional concept or whether those are not even, it's possible that the Supreme Court will say that that is not even allowed. So do you have any idea about how that might impact <clears throat> uh, domestic violence in general or do you have any other thoughts on that? Um, yes, so those of you who are interested in this, um, the, specifically the provision in VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, the original, um, the provision in VAWA, there's a, a section that says it is illegal, as I said, to transfer or give 
a gun to somebody who's under a restraining order, uh, not an ex parte, a restraining order. Um, so it's essentially been interpreted in three different Supreme Court decisions uh, who upheld the provision that you can't have a gun if you're under a domestic uh, violence restraining order, and states have passed co co corollary laws. So in the case of United States versus Rahimi, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is um, a southern court uh, based mostly in, in, based in Texas, um, and it, um, it tends to be on the more conservative side. And after the Bruin decision, Bruin v. New York, sort of changed the nature of uh, state purview on guns, there, it's a complicated case, Rahimi, but the Fifth Circuit ruled that the provision that prevents somebody who's under a domestic violence restraining order but has not been convicted of domestic violence is unconstitutional. Rahimi, this individual, actually was under, uh, was accused of domestic violence, pleaded um, guilty in civil court under a arbitration for domestic disputes, and because he pleaded guilty in the civil court to a domestic violence assault, he was supposed to be prohibited because he was under a restraining order. So it's very complicated, but then, so he couldn't have a gun. But then he um, was uh, the Bruin decision, then he appealed the decision to the appeals court, and the appeals court um, upheld the conviction, but then reversed themselves when Bruin was issued and sent it back down. And then Rahimi uh, ended up shooting literally in five different incidents, shot five different, at shot at five different people, and the police arrested him in Texas and said, you are not only in violation for using a weapon, but you're not allowed to have a weapon because you're under a domestic violence uh, agreement in which you conceded that you were guilty and you're not supposed to have a weapon. So even, but it's not criminal court, he was not convicted of domestic violence in criminal court, it's part of a civil, civil uh, agreement, and so the Fifth Circuit threw it out in a long opinion and said that his, his rights were violated. Where he this himself did not have the wherewithal to appeal all these decisions, he's being supported by um, uh, Second Amendment groups. So now the Justice Department immediately uh, appealed this decision to the Supreme Court, which within a month uh, over the summer said they would hear the case. So uh, they're starting oral arguments on November 7th. Now, um, one of the key elements in this case, and we've written about it in blogs on Brookings and Bloomberg Law. Uh, Liz Tobin Tyler is a professor here in the medical school. She's written quite a bit about it. Uh, lots of people are writing about this. The difference is that Justice Thomas and Bruin said, if you are innocent, you ought to be able to keep your gun. I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But if you are a, a criminal and you violated the law, then you don't have this protection anymore. So the argument is um, whether he broke the restraining order or he was, he was arrested for using his gun illegally and shooting five different times. Um, and that's the big problem. Uh, and, and then also, if you're not a law-abiding citizen, that's what John, Justice Thomas says, if you're not a law-abiding citizen. Clearly, Rahimi is not a law-abiding citizen. Uh, the practical implication, if the Supreme Court strikes this down, is that more women will die uh, by gun from the, at the hands of their uh, intimate abusers. There is no question about that, because we know nearly 50% of women die this way anyway, uh, and we know the laws work. So this is the, the key provision of VAWA. My, my guess is if they strike it down, um, Biden will ask the Democrats in the Senate, at least, to try to reintroduce it. And, uh, but I, I am not persuaded. We'll have to see about oral argument. I'm not persuaded that they will strike it down because they've had a principle that if you violate the law, you relinquish your protections in this way, your rights to own a gun. Uh, and they've been pretty consistent about that. Bruin has been interpreted to be wider than it is, actually, right? It says you, if you already have a permit to own a gun, the state cannot restrict your movement with that gun because the state's already said you're entitled to own the gun. This is a different scenario. So we have to wait and see, but it's not clear, and we'll know from oral argument where they're leaning. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see on Rahimi, but it is it, it, it's essential 
essential to the protections of our violence against women. And you can see states gearing up to try to do things that will accord with their constitutions um, to try to remedy this, but we won't know. They'll hear in November, and I don't think they'll issue a decision till the spring, but we'll know from oral arguments possibly which way they're leaning. So it's, it's vitally important, these protections and implementation. You wouldn't even need additional laws, you could argue in some ways, if implementation was better, but then given the prevalence of guns, there is danger to police officers from trying to implement, uh, and social services play a crucial role in the fabric. It's, it's a topic nobody really likes to talk about, but it's a topic that absolutely affects all of us um, all the time and, and, and is a, a component of the epidemic of gun violence. So it is, it is not a cheery subject. I will not be giving a TED talk anytime soon on this, uh, but I'm really proud of the opportunity that Brown has given Caitlin and me and Donnie and all the students that you've seen listed uh, to do this kind of work that we believe really does have, have potential resonance. And we're gonna continue to work on this issue and continue to try to, um, to get the word out. We're actually sponsoring uh, an event on Wednesday the 18th next week with the Royal On Coalition Against Domestic Violence to talk about this issue again. So we're, we're not uh, letting go of it and it's it's an opportunity for students to do research in this area and get new skills um, and be co-authors and uh, also for Brown to make a difference, I think, in the public policy arena. So on that note, I hope you have a happy, cheery weekend. <laughs>